Good morning, Yuma, welcome. I'm Beth Orton, manager of the Development Policy Centre, part of the Crawford School of Public Policy here at ANU. We acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we are meeting here today at the Crawford School, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay respect to their elders, past and present. We welcome distinguished guests here today and representatives of high commissions and embassies. Thank you all for joining us, whether in person or online. We encourage you to live tweet this event via the hashtag election22. This is the first in a series of three election forums offering the major political parties a chance to articulate their thinking on international development and their future policies and plans. These forums have been organised in collaboration between the International Development Contractors Community, the Australian Council for International Development and the Development Policy Centre here at ANU. We have come together because we, all three partners, share a deep interest in Australia's international development policy. With the recent events in the Solomon Islands, we are seeing, for the first time in a long time, aid and foreign policy issues playing a prominent role in an Australian election campaign. We are delighted that all three major parties have accepted our invitation to speak on where inter international development sits in Australian foreign relations, their vision for making our development e efforts as effective as possible, the need to strengthen development capability in the Australian government, procedural or systems changes that the parties think are required to increase the impact of the development program and what resources the parties would dedicate to the program and its effective planning, management and assessment by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Today, we are eager to hear from Senator Janet Rice and Senator Marine Faruqi on the Australian Greens' priorities for reshaping the development program to respond to current and future challenges and opportunities. Senator Janet Rice has been a Green Senator in the Australian Parliament since 2014 and is the Australian Green spokesperson on foreign affairs, multiculturalism, forests, LGBTIQ, family, ageing and community services. Dr Marine Faruqi is the Green Senator for New South Wales and spokesperson on international aid and development education, housing, animal welfare, local government and gun control. Following their address, Senator Rice and Senator Faruqi will be joined in conversation by Virginia Halsiger. Virginia is a, an award-winning journalist and gender, gender advocate, advocate, sorry, gender equity advocate. Her extensive media career spans 30 years in which Virginia has reported around the globe for prominent and prime time current affairs programs on the Seven and Nine Networks and the ABC, as well as anchoring the ABC's flagship TV news in Canberra from 2001 to 2016. Virginia currently hosts Broad Talk, a podcast about women, power and leadership. In 2017, Virginia established the 5050 by 2030 Foundation at the University of Canberra, where she is an adjunct professor and served as the Foundation's inaugural director. In 2019, Virginia was named ACT Australian of the Year. Please join me in welcoming 
Senator Rice and Senator Baruki. Thank you. It is an absolute delight to be here with you, and I really want to thank the ANU and the other organisations for inviting us to speak. I'm going to start giving a foreign policy perspective or some context for our um, Greens position on international development, which Mayreen will then go into some more details about. Of course, I did want to acknowledge that we're on the lands of the Ngunnawal and the Gambri peoples and pay respect to their elders, past and present, and to all First Nations peoples, including any who are with us today, and to re really um, restate the need to be putting First Nations justice at the centre of everything we do and to be working for treaties with our First Nations peoples. And I think talking about foreign policy and aid and development, it's really important to do that because acknowledging these injustices is particularly relevant because we need to also be addressing the serious human rights violations that are going on here in Australia if we're going to be a credible player on the world stage. And we need justice for our First Nations peoples and we need to end the appalling detention of asylum seekers that's involved in measurable suffering. Um, I always find elections to be a time of ex excitement and optimism because it's a time when things can actually change. There's a hope that we can actually see the implementation of some of the Greens' bold and far-reaching platform um, if we find ourselves having kicked out the Morrison government and being in the balance of power to be pushing a Labor government to be going further and faster in a whole raft of things. And fundamentally, the Greens want to be using our democracy to implement pol policies to achieve the Greens' four pillars of ecological sustainability, social justice, peace and nonviolence, and participatory democracy. I mean, you'll note that these four pillars are bold, they are global, and they are interconnected. Now, I was one of the founders of the Greens in Victoria 30 years ago, and I'm a proud to be an active part of the Global Greens, which was formed here in Canberra, actually, in 2001, and it now brings together Green parties and movements from over 60 countries around the world. We Greens recognise that we are part of global humanity and the web of life across the world. And we recognise, as the recent Common Security 2022 report laid out as a principle, that all people have a right to human security, freedom from fear and freedom from want. And we believe that Australia has got a responsibility to help make human security for all people a reality. And to do that, that we need to ad ad adopt a clear principles-based approach to foreign policy and development rather than one of geopolitical convenience. Because we know that lasting solutions to conflicts depend on, de on delivering economic, social and environmental justice to the peoples involved and on ensuring that people can exercise their civil and political rights. We recognise that climate change and ecological destruction are security threats which need to be prioritised. We support the rights of all peoples to self-determination. We believe our foreign policy should work to overcome the violence, the trauma, the resource stripping, the attempted genocides of colonial invasions and imperialism. And we know that we need to be always challenging racism, patriarchy, heteronormativity and militarism. And to do this requires, as again the Common Security 2022 report also outlined as a principle, that dialogue conflict prevention and confidence building measures need to replace aggression and military force as a means of resolving disputes, which of course puts our work in international aid and development absolutely at the forefront of foreign policy. Because what are such dialogue, conflict prevention and confidence building measures? Basically, they are investments in development and diplomacy and measures to support and to encourage human rights and peace and justice and to build inclusive democratic governance at all levels in all societies, including and empowering women, young people and minorities. But of course, the fundamental dilemma with foreign policy is that these things haven't been and still aren't a priority of Australia's international relations or of the majority of states across the world. And we're facing the rise of authoritarian, militaristic and expansionist regimes and in a context of US power being used to support regimes that it perceives as being compliant to its interests and role as a world power, rather than necessarily being driven by a commitment to self-determination, sovereignty and human rights. So what do we do in this real politics space when the warmongers are becoming more strident, when people like our Defence Minister Peter Dutton 
feels emboldened to pronounce that the only way you can preserve peace is to prepare for war and be strong as a country, not to cower, not to be on bended knee and be weak. And we Greens wholeheartedly reject this. In fact, such posturing and deprioritising or ignoring measures other than militarism and painting them as weak is exactly what will be flaming the prospects of war that will be so destructive to the world as to be almost unimaginable. The priority has to be to de-escalate. I mean, it would have been so much better to have prioritised supporting peace and democracy movements and empowering civil society overall, as well as targeted interventions and sanctions years ago, if not decades ago. But it's never too late to ramp these measures up, and they should always be where the priority is, rather than responding to violence with violence. So we welcome, for example, the Australian government's response to the invasion of Ukraine the targeted sanctions, the divestments, and the banning of imports of some Russian fossil fuels. Better late than never. But these responses have created a stark contrast with the Australian government's foreign policy up till now, both in regard to Russia and across the globe. I mean, unfathomably, we still haven't imposed sanctions upon the leaders of the coup in Myanmar. We are betraying the Myanmar community that we have invested with development and aid over the last decade, helping to build civil and women's rights and democratic institutions. We've just signed a huge, a new trade deal with India without saying a word about the huge attacks on democracy across Indian society and in Kashmir. And with regards to China, while successive Australian governments, both Labor and Liberal, over decades, they were desperate to sign so-called free trade agreements, and it was only the Australian Greens who consistently raised human rights and advocated that the Australians should be doing more, the Australian government should be doing more, including imposing targeted sanctions against those officials who have committed serious human rights violations. And of course, in more recent years, as the political winds have shifted, many of those that were touting free trade agreements have shifted to criticising the Chinese government. The Greens believe that these criticisms should have been and should continue to be centred on abuse of human rights by the Chinese government, and that we should be applying as much diplomatic development and trade influence that we can muster, rather than now immediately shifting, shifting to warmongering. And finally, the Greens believe that the credible foreign policy approach has to involve renegotiating the US alliance. You cannot be critical of powers like China and Russia without acknowledging the massive undermining of human rights and sovereignty that the US has been responsible for. And without a consistently principles-based foreign policy, the Australian government's approach remains open to criticisms of hypocrisy and racism, picking and choosing whose human rights we privilege over others. But as I said at the beginning, I'm excited about the election. I'm excited about the prospect of us being in balance of power in the House and the Senate. I'm excited of then being able to push a government to go further and faster on a whole raft of issues, including foreign policy and international development. So I'll now hand over to Maureen to go into more detail about our development policy. Thanks, Janet. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Very delighted to be here with all of you, and thanks so much for having us, and also Eid Mubarak to those celebrating the end of Ramadan. Um, I, too, start by acknowledging the sovereign owners of the land we gathered on, the Nanawal and Namri people, and pay my respects to elders, past and present. This is, always was, and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, and I think it is really important to recognize that as we strive for justice and equity here in this country, First Nations people and their voices must be front and center of that struggle, and justice must come on their terms, not ours. Um, and in the context of international aid especially, we must also commit to Australian aid projects recognizing the rights of indigenous communities to free, prior, and informed consent, as recognized in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So global racial justice must be at the heart of Australian aid. And to make that happen from where the Greens sit, we must reimagine international aid not simply as charity, but as an issue of global justice, not as a way to further our own national ambitions, but as a way to right historic wrongs, not as a way to further greedy trade interests, but as a way to build communities who have been left destitute for decades upon decades. 
I mean, Australia has an obligation, particularly as a wealthy country, and given our colonial past, to encourage positive and equitable change in social, economic, and environmental justice in the global south. We know that successive governments here in Australia have taken an ax to Australia's aid budgets, but we have seen particularly devastating cuts during the Liberal National Government. And for the first time in history, Australia's aid budget is same, shamefully set to fall below 0.2% of GNI. The current budget, released just before the government announced this election, tells us that next year our aid will fall to a measly 0.18% of GNI. This is such a far cry from the United Nations target of at least 0.7%. But the quantity of aid isn't the only question. What is the point of a $10 billion aid program if it just feathers the nests of private companies, for instance? Transformative change does require resources, absolutely. But most importantly, it requires the courage to set new rules. And these new rules must take us on the road of decolonizing our aid program. We live in a world where the global north has long had a colonial and extractive relationship with the global south, a world where inequality between people living in different parts of the globe is one of the most urgent emergencies, I think, facing humanity at the moment. So it is time to abandon old assumptions and accept that aid, for it to be effective, must be decolonized. So poverty in the global south is a result of colonization and the ongoing legacy of colonialism through the continued extraction of resources and the grossly unfair neoliberal trade and debt systems. I mean, we have to look at aid as a debt owed, not as a favor bestowed on the global south. And the Greens want to bring our aid budget up to at least 0.7% of GNI by 2030 and add climate reparations on top of this, which must be commensurate with our historical and ongoing um, influence and contribution to that problem. COVID-19 has only deepened inequality and poverty. The climate emergency looms very large in the landscape of global inequality. And given Australia's dirty hands in climate changing emissions, we have a special responsibility to do everything we can for climate justice. The recent IPCC Working Group 2 report assessing climate change impacts, adaptation and vulnerability laid bare the devastating consequences of climate inaction for the world's poorest communities, particularly women and girls who are on the front line of gender-based poverty, inequality, and climate-induced disasters. Uh, in Lahore, in Pakistan, where I grew up, there is currently an unprecedented heat wave that is really testing the limits of humanity and human survivability. And it's not even summer yet. Spring never arrived this year in Pakistan and most of places in India, and the summers just keep getting longer. And across the Pacific, as we all know, communities are facing the daily realities of the climate crisis that they did not cause. The deadly cyclones, the floods, the sea level rises that are threatening livelihoods, food security, homes, and safety. So this election, we have put forward a policy to provide climate finance and reparations of $4.5 billion from 2022 to 2025. That's triple the commitment that this government has made. And that is a bare minimum of our fair share. And the Greens are determined to push the next government to include climate finance and reparations as an important component of the aid program on top of the 0.7% GNI. In an attempt to reduce global inequality, the Greens also have a policy this election to cancel all of Australia's bilateral debt and ensure that we have a strong and principled, that we are a strong and principled advocate for global debt cancellation. Australian aid programs must be a genuine partnership with the recipient communities, with accountability and transparency. They must recognize the strengths, capabilities, and knowledge of partner countries and communities. That is part of how we decolonize the delivery of aid. Many of you here know that communities are very easily able to identify the problems that they face. And our role is to 
work with them in removing barriers to self-determination. So the Greens are committed to increasing our aid budget, paying the fair share of climate reparations, climate finance to tackle the root causes of inequality. The scale of our ambition, our passion, and our determination matches the scale of the problem that we face. Thanks so much. Well, thank you very much to both uh, Senator Rice and Senator Faruqi. Um, we, there are plenty of questions I can already feel in the room, and I am going to, uh, to make plenty of time for you to ask uh, questions of both the senators and specifically um, kick off with questions from the, the sponsors of this event. But before we do, there's a few things I'm going to jump in and ask. I <laughs> can't help myself. Um, I, I must say, um, Janet, I hope you don't mind me just going straight to, to uh, first names, but Janet, I was really uh, interested and kind of um, amused to hear you say how much you enjoy elections and that you find them really exciting. <laughs> I find them very anxiety-ridden. <laughs> Very, very anxiety ridden and uh, in my case in particular, I've just written a column uh, about this, the, the lack of women's policy that gets, um, gets uh, attention during these times. And um, certainly the lack of attention given to aid and development is something that everyone in this room would be very, mm -hmm. very aware of. So my first question to both of you really is, is the who cares question, who cares? Now, I think that given, um, and I'm hearing this very much through my podcast at the moment, uh, from women in particular, people are very focused on the bad news around the world. It feels like the strong men are well, certainly out of control but are, are growing in power, the, the, the senseless war in Ukraine, etc., etc. And I, I'm sensing a, a folding in of women in particular withdrawing mm -hmm. and turning away. Now, it has always surprised me as a journalist that aid and development and the amount of money that Australia spends on aid, certainly in the days when that was a, a, a very, um, something to be proud of, um, it, it surprised me that governments here didn't talk more about that and therefore the public didn't know much about our aid and development. And in fact, polling has shown over years that the general public think Australia spends a lot more on aid than in fact it does, um, substantially so. In fact, I think there was a poll in 2015 that, that um, the, the Australian public found, uh, said that they thought in general about 5% of the federal budget went towards mm. foreign aid, which couldn't have been further from the truth. <laughs> um, so the, the who cares question, um, what's your extent of how much the, the, the public do these issues, how much the issues around aid and development resonate with mm. the public? And of course, both of you are in on the ground speaking to constituents and elect, uh, electors and indeed Australians mm -hmm. all the time. So uh, to both of you, mm -hmm. tell, tell us your thoughts about the who cares and how much question. So I think you're absolutely right. People still think that they, we give a lot more aid than we actually do. Maybe they do remember the good old days because no, people stopped talking, the government stopped talking about aid uh, when they started reducing the amount because it was terrible and embarrassing. Um, I feel that um, given COVID, um, given the climate crisis um, and given the international situation at the moment, um, international issues are at the top and front and centre of people's minds. Um, there was a lot of discussion during COVID about the inequity uh, of vaccines, for instance, between the global north and the global south. Um, there was a lot of media on how Australia refused to wholeheartedly back and support the TRIPS waiver, which would allow vaccines to be manufactured uh, in the global south. So, when I'm in and around the community, it, I think it is an issue that is quite heightened. And that is shown also by the you know, ABC Vote Compass recently. Um, both Labour voters and Greens voters, more than 50% of them think that Australia should increase its aid. Um, Liberal voters, quite a different <laughs> story. Um, and that's another reason why we need to turf this government. And with Labour and Greens in shared power, we can actually push this issue forward because I do think when we announced last year even um, our policy on decolonizing aid, for instance, there was so much interest from the community. I attended forum after forum talking about this issue. Um, so I think that the global justice angle mm 
um, off aid is is front and centre of people at the moment. Yeah, and I think the cuts to our aid budget haven't been because people mm. don't care. It's be, been because it's been an easy thing for government to cut mm. funding because mm. there aren't any voters that are directly going to feel it. And so it's been, well, if we need to reduce government spending, which we reject that you need mm -hmm. to, well, mm. then, OK, we can cut the aid budget and no-one's going to notice. Mm. And I, I think then you have the situation also of people feeling fairly despairing when they look at the international situation and think, well, what can we as Australia do? And so it's really supporting people to know that there is a lot that we can do. And I think with that, so people feel that, yes, this is a, a good way and an appropriate way to be spending to be spending some of our money. Given that we seem to have this culture, nevertheless, in Parliament of governments not talking a great deal publicly about aid spend, and, um, and, and, and what uh, Australia is doing internationally in terms of aid and development. Are you sensing that, I mean, it, that, that that conversation might change um, at political level such that we can generate or that, that an a incoming government, whoever that might be, might be more open to talking publicly about these issues? I would hope so. And I think, yes, because of COVID, because of the climate crisis, because of the, all of the international um, you know, wars and, and other, other upsets and coups, um, there is a heightened awareness of the, I, I, of the need for us to be, to be taking action and, and I think there is an appetite for it. And I'm hoping that, you know, if we did have an incoming, you know, Labor government supported by the Greens, that there would be a, more of a sense that this is something that we really do need to maintain I, a focus on. I think everyone would agree with you about the hope, but what, I'm, what I really want to know is, are you having those conversations yourself in Parliament with the appropriate people such that you feel they are going to put, uh, or, or they are going to listen more to what the Greens are saying in this regard? I mean, I think they will have to be dragged to the table to listen more. I mean, from the policies that I know, Liberals have no change. Uh, the Labour policy at the moment that has been announced is pretty measly as well in terms of increasing aid. So they are not keen on changing much. Um, so they will have to be forced to the table, and that's why the importance of, you know, the Greens in shared power, where we'll, we will actually have some negotiating power to change those conversations. And I think communities although there is heightened awareness, but there still isn't like a huge outcry, for instance, mm. about this issue. And politicians, you know, do listen to communities. Um, they are, you know, their constituents. So I think there is work to be done on that. I, I think another factor which has changed in Australia, say, over the last you know, 30 years that I've been involved in politics, is the increasing proportion of our, of our um, community who are migrant um, migrants to Australia and increasing proportion who are you know, refugees and asylum seekers and have got connections with countries right across the world. So we've got very large diaspora communities and so I have lots of people with my dual roles of foreign affairs and multiculturalism are reaching out to these communities who really want to see Australia be taking a strong role when it comes to you know, taking action say, about the coup in Sudan or the, the war in, in Ethiopia and Tigray. You know, and they know that there is a role that Australia can be playing. And as we get a larger and larger proportion of the Australian population, we've got those direct links of, you know, and directly families sort of, like, you know, you talk to the Myanmar community and the people who are just so worried about their mm. friends and their families who are suffering under the coup in Myanmar. Um, and they are people that are, you know, they are Australians who are voting. And so I think there is, there's an appetite, but as Maureen said, we really need to you know, push mm. the major parties to actually listen to people. Yep. How high is aid and development on your own agenda, the Greens agenda, um, in relation to, example, climate change? Where, where does it come on your platform of priorities? Well, it is part of, like I said, the aid mm. program. It is part of our climate strategy. So pretty high in terms of climate What's finance. What's pretty high, mean? <laughs> I mean, it's, you know... <laughs> like, inter interconnected Yeah, this is the thing. So, you know, we know, you know that the climate crisis and the way we see it is very interlinked with social justice and inequality. You, they are inseparable. So the climate crisis is obviously one of the top things on our agenda, and with it is the social justice, which is about international development and aid. And hence the tripling of... Um, climate finance, like the, the Australian government hasn't paid anything since 2018, I think, in the Green Climate Fund, which was agreed to 
um, the Copen Copenhagen Accord and you know the Paris Agreement. So uh, obviously with the liberal government, climate and anything associated with climate is just way down there or invisible. Um, but for us, it is part of our uh, you know, climate um, package, which again will be top of our agenda when we negotiate with the next government. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to ask you about decolonisation. Um, mm -hmm. I, I find this fascinating I'm, and I'm, I'm not surprised that when you uh, talk about this publicly you get a lot of interest too um, from Australians. But mm -hmm. I've got to say I, I, I struggle with understanding the practicalities mm -hmm. around this. Mm -hmm. um, I, I struggle uh, to understand whether when you talk about decolonising aid, whether you, you, you are talking about um, uh, empowering local actors mm -hmm. um, or decentralising control mm -hmm. um, or, or, you know, fully wholesale giving back agency and leadership to those on the ground. Mm -hmm. So let, I'd like you to unpack that a little bit, mm -hmm. but before you do, let, let's go first into can you give us some practical examples of what you're talking about when you talk about decolonisation? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess when I talk about decolonising aid, it is first and foremost the accept acceptance that there is structural racism in the way aid um, is funded and delivered. So when I say structural racism, I'm talking about um, you know, the, the white saviour complex, for instance, the, the white gazing. Um, you, you know, how aid is formulated and often delivered um, in a way where Western supremacy, it's like our way is the best way mm. to deliver aid. Um, I can give you one example of that. In Pakistan, there were massive floods in 2006. Um, there was a lot of aid given, and part of that aid was millions upon millions of bottles of, of water, mm. right? Um, now, those communities that were suffering from the floods um, and had their rivers, you know, full of sediment and all, they were suspicious of bottled water. So all of that water was wasted because no one really talked to the communities on the ground, asked them what the cultural norms are, what the situation is, and how we could help them. So in terms of funding, you know, as I said in my speech earlier as well, we have to think, like really think of aid not as a charity or white people saving brown or black people, mm -hmm. But it is actually, um, you know, looking at it as an issue of justice where those people have been screwed over for centuries. Mm. And this mm. is something that we owe them. <clears throat> um, so that's the concept of it. But in terms of delivery, it's how we plan programs, which projects get funded. That has to come from the recipient community. Mm. Mm. Um, even the way, um, the criteria for assessing success it's not about us saying, you know, we're giving this much money and this is what we want delivered and this is how we measure success. It's those people on the ground and the communities on the ground that have to, um, you know, measure success. Another example I've just thought of is in Bangladesh, of course, same flooding every year. Um, and, you know, this is about women as well. You know, women do a lot of the frontline work in many of these communities, especially in rural areas. Um, so every time there was flooding, there were aid programs and you know, in one of those areas, it was women who, you know, ran um, chook farms, you know, and, um, you know, then used the money from there, like selling eggs and all of that. And every time flooding would happen, all the chickens would die. Mm -hmm. And every time, you know, the aid program, more chickens. Um, and one, when they consulted women, they said, well, ducks is what we need. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of hilarious, but, it, you know, it's like we, it's yeah. those things which are sometimes very simple things. I think the NGOs um, and the sector is realising more and more the importance of this, but it definitely hasn't trickled down to government in the way they think. Uh, it's I, about giving power, redistributing power at the end of the day. It is about redistributing power. It's not that we are giving money so we are in control, mm. no. Mm. It's money we owe these places and they are in control of it. They know how to best spend and distribute it. Of mm. course, there should be accountability and transparency around it. I suspect there's probably everyone in this room has got a story about the, similar to the, the water bottle story yeah. um, of, of inappropriate action. Yeah. And I know when I visited Afghanistan in 2009, I went to a number of NGOs, women NGOs, all the women were doing programs to learn sewing. Mm. 
and, and every of the 41 nations mm. were spending a lot of money in Afghanistan and setting up programs for women to learn how to sew. And then finally someone said to me, Virginia, they don't need how to learn. They, they, one of the Afghan women said, they don't need to learn how to sew. They will know how to I sew. I know, <laughs> exactly. I, learned, I knew well, so, how to sew yeah. any <laughs> instrument. Well, I know. Right? <laughs> um, but, but I guess this comes back to a question that um, is, is very pertinent, and, and particularly for this audience, is what value, given what you've just said, what value do you place on the expertise, though, of um, well, experts in aid and development mm -hmm. that do parachute in, um, but have been doing this work for a long time and do understand the the local needs and perhaps even speak the local language, etc. How much how much value do you place on those sort of experts? Well, there is value in expertise, but expertise doesn't just come in the form of experience of aid organisations and experts. There is local knowledge, expertise. There is you know. Uh, community knowledge, there is indigenous knowledges. So mm -hmm. I think they all have to come together. But I think the basic thing is expertise, obviously advice, expertise, all of that is there. But it's who holds the power in the end mm -hmm. to make decisions mm -hmm. on how things happen. And obviously people everywhere, they would like expertise and advice. There's a lot of expertise in those countries as well. Um, but it's, it is about giving up that power and control to those it, communities. It goes to our you know, the fundamental principle of, our, of the Greens, of participatory democracy, of actually involving, <coughs> genuinely sharing that power. So rather than mm. having that power to have power over people, genuinely having processes where you are sharing power and people are being listened to and not just ignored. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get better decisions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, so, but you are in, therefore you are acknowledging that uh, th those grassroots groups on the ground still benefit from the expertise of, of um, humanitarian groups, as, NGOs coming in. As advice, that's right. So they come in, they say, this is what we can offer, but it's in an in a environment where it's advice rather than we know what's best and this is what mm. we're going mm. to do to you. Mm. Okay. I want to throw it open to um, questions from the audience, but I, I want to kick that off by asking first and foremost the, the various sponsors of this organisation. To, uh, to ask some questions. And um, from my DCC, Jane, where is Jane? Ah, oh, here she is. Yeah, now Jane, Jane, you mentioned, um, uh, Janice, earlier on um, the ODA level against GNI, and I think Jane wants to talk specifically about that or ask you about that, Jane. Ah, thank you very much to Senator Rice and Furuki for coming this morning. Um, it's been uh, very interesting to hear your speeches. Can um, I just get you to hold that closer to your mouth? Is that better? better. That's better. So, uh, as you've said, 0.7% of GNI is a part of your policy um, platform. So, we were just wondering whether you have costed that commitment uh, and where the funds uh, for fulfilling it might come from. Yeah, we absolutely have costed it through the Parliamentary Budgetary Office. Um, and funds will come from, so it is, I think, 11.6 billion over forwards and 114 billion till 2032. Um, and uh, the funds will come from making big corporations pay their fair share of tax. And we've costed all of that as well. And we've got a, like a billionaire's wealth tax. We have got a corporate super profit tax as well as a tax on mining and petroleum, depending on what the projects are. And we know that those corporate mining and petroleum um, taxes will raise $430 billion over 10 years. If you look at the subsidies, that's a separate thing provided to fossil fuel. Um, at the moment, it's, I think it's 11.6 billion a year. Yeah. So, you know, there, there is money there which is being put in back into the pockets of the already super wealthy. So that's where the money is going to come from because this, we think, is a much better investment than giving billionaires more money to waste. Plus, plus not going ahead with the state's tax cuts, yes. which are going to cost the budget bottom line $180 billion over the next 10 years. Mm. That's a massive amount of money that should be being put into programs both domestically and internationally. It's about prioritising yeah. yeah. where yeah. the money should go. <laughs> Well, in terms of the billionaires, there's, there's a, a, a very good RSPT um, a policy tax gathering dust somewhere that uh, didn't quite get um, implemented. I'm sure that uh, that would be useful. Um, Jane, do you have a follow-up question there? 
Yeah, I did. So uh, thank you so much for setting that out. Um, just in terms of actually delivering a substantially increased um, aid budget, I just wonder whether there were any sort of specific outcomes that you were looking to expand upon uh, and also um, where the capability might come from for delivering um, such a large amount of money. Thank you. Mm. Um, well, you know, it is over 10 years and other countries do it as well. So the capability, is, I guess the long term um, idea of aid is to build capabilities within those communities, right? That's what it's about. That's part of the decolonizing as well. Um, so that's the ultimate aim, because we want to lift communities out of poverty and destitution um, and address the climate crisis, but on their terms. Um, so that's where the capability comes in. Thanks, Jane. Now, I'd like to also throw over to, to Mark uh, from Ackford. Uh, Mark, I think you wanted, uh, you had some questions spe specifically on human rights and aid. Thanks, Virginia. Um, and thanks, Senators, for that great overview and summary of the Greens' uh, positions. Um, you rightfully have a very strong position of solidarity on human rights when you mentioned Sudan and Myanmar. Um, I'm interested in your position on conditionality of aid. So uh, should we be, you know, suspending aid if human rights are violated and then sort of flipping it around localisation, um, you know, it's, it's not uncommon now for governments uh, such as India and Cambodia to say, well, uh, you know, the assistance that NGOs, uh, international NGOs are giving uh, local civil society, we don't want that. That is actually, we, we've decolonised, it's racist, um, and they can be quite, as, as we're aware in India, you know, cutting off funding uh, on those grounds. So I'm just interested in your views on, on when localisation is uh, used by governments in the South uh, as an argument for not giving assistance. Mm. Um, yeah, I think it is a problem. I think we should still continue and try to work with grassroots communities um, because, you know, we know sometimes the motives of governments around places. Yes, right? yes, suppressing yeah, exactly. We have seen that. I mean, how that operates is complex. Um, but working with community, I mean, I guess there is critique and criticism of how aid is delivered. But I guess we have to make a judgment and change our ways as well and how we deliver aid so that the critique you, we, can, we can say, well, that's not the case, you know, that's not defensible anymore. Um, but I do think that communities are struggling in many parts of the world because human rights are being suppressed um, in the name of <laughs> um, human rights. Um, so, um, yeah, I feel that we must work with grassroots communities wherever we can. That would be kind of my stand, Janet. Yeah, and look, and obviously, I mean, we have to have the transparency and that accountability so that mm. you know where the money is being spent. But I think, I mean, if particularly if you look at you know, countries like Myanmar and Afghanistan at the moment, the absolute need to mm. continue aid, but for it to be going through mm. those grassroots community organisations rather than um, being siphoned off to corrupt regimes. Can I just follow up on, on that issue, particularly with Afghanistan, which is it's such a vexed one. Mm. Um, uh, the layers of corruption along the way, and, and this is certainly what I experienced um, when I was there, the layers of hand, or that number of hands money went through when it was sent through formally before it got to the grassroots level were, were enormous. Yep. And, and, and the corruption all along the way was really evident. Um, I don't know how you work around that. Um, I don't even know if, if it's possible. So again, I come back to that question of, of practicality. While it could be nice that we say, you know, we're only going to deal with grassroots levels, um, the reality is to actually get anything in there. And I know yeah. I'm working with groups struggling with Afghanistan on this exact thing exactly. right now. And yeah. how do we do that? And it's obviously there is a bit of negotiation because of the power that those regimes hold. Mm. But there are still, you know, grassroots organisations that are doing their best on the ground. Oh, of course. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my hope is promise is one that yeah. comes to mind at the moment, you know, yeah. working with women and girls in... in in camps in, in Kabul. Who yeah. also works with local authorities. And I've yeah. been there when we invited the minister mm. along to open the little medical mm. centre we'd mm. set up. Um, and of course, you know, mm. that entails mm. all sorts of things, as you mm. can imagine. But it's practical. Yes. Yeah. Yep. You know, it, 
Exactly. And, and you know that mm. the money is being spent to the benefit of people. I mean, Myanmar is another example where the diaspora community have told us here there are ways of getting that aid in that they're going to be mm. benefiting the people in Myanmar and they want Australian government funding to be going through those community-based organisations. And it's the same and, everywhere. And there's, yeah. there's been a reluctance to do that. I mean, I know there, again, is issues of the transparency and the accountability and making sure the structures are in place. But we had, I think, Foreign Affairs are now talking to those Myanmar communities. We've had a number of Senate inquiries where the community said, no, they haven't been talking to us, you know. They are in direct contact with the people on the ground. They know what's needed. They know that there are avenues of actually getting, getting aid in, but um, Foreign Affairs hasn't been talking to them. Mm. Mm. You can't put it in a too hard basket. In Pakistan, where I grew up, it's the same situation. There are grassroots organisations who do excellent work. And, you know, yes, there are the practicalities, but. Um, there are levels and different le levels with different organisations work, like some you really need uh, to pay layers upon layers of people, mm. bribes to get well, there. They are bribes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they are. But for others, it's much less. So I think we may have to make an effort to find which those organisations are because they exist. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I, I, just coming back to Afghanistan again, obviously I'm a bit obsessed with it, but what, what is your view in terms of... Um, the acknowledgement of the Taliban, for example, we know the Taliban is, is, is pushing very hard to be acknowledged by the UN, um, at which of course will legitimise it. Uh, should, should that happen? No. Well, no. Well, and, well, obviously it shouldn't happen, but if it does, what happens? Should Australia be withdrawing aid all, all together? Well, we shouldn't be withdrawing aid because, and again, you know, going back to as long as that aid is reaching the people on the ground who are, you know, there's a starvation absolute crisis that's going on in Afghanistan now. So we absolutely need to keep supplying that, that aid. But no, we should not be recognising the Taliban. And I think it's, you know, things, we have to continue the, the pressure so that we don't just accept that there is this incredibly undemocratic, repressive regime um, that's there, you know, for the, for the long term. There has to be, you know, global pressure to, to get change in Afghanistan. And it's, you look at it now and it's just, how do you do that? It doesn't mm. seem impossible. And particularly and with despairing, and, you know, knowing people who are there and, and talking to the mm. um, Afghan community here, it's awful. Mm. Um, but we've got to, you know, globally and multilaterally, the world has got to keep on, keep on we've, working, we've, what we're, yeah. working out what we're doing. We've got to remind ourselves how the country is in that situation. It is now. It is a lot of Western imperialism that has been part of that problem mm. and that's the responsibility we should remember in terms of now rebuilding um, you know I guess empower I hate using the word empowering communities but kind of supporting communities to get back on their feet so that they are um, in a place where they themselves can determine what their future country looks like Okay, I want to throw another question out now to, um, well, to the Development Policy Centre. Uh, Dr. Ryan Edwards is, where is? Um, yeah. Ah, th thank you. Thank you both for joining us today. Um, so simply letting people migrate opportunity is one of the most effective development interventions we know of and expanding opportunities for Pacific Islanders to participate in labour mobility in Australia offers enormous potential benefits, including through remittances, skills, many other chan channels. And Labor's made some pretty significant announcements during the campaign about this. So I wanted to ask you, what is the Greens policy when it comes to Pacific Labor mobility and what, if any, changes would you pursue in relation to the existing schemes currently in place? I think that one's for you. Oh. <laughs> you, can, you can share that one. All right. Thank you, Ron. Um, <laughs> I mean, basically, we've got to make sure, I think, we've got to make sure that the schemes are treating the work as well is the fundamental thing. And, and making sure that people aren't being exploited when they come here. And that's has been a feature of and the history of Pacific... Um, labour mobility, you know, right back to blackbirding days. Um, and so it's not something that we have a, a strong position as to whether they should be increased or, or decreased, but ensuring that any schemes that are put in place are actually benefiting the people um, and not ending up with worker exploitation when they come here. I think from what I remember, the labour announcement is about providing permanent residency, which I think is a good thing because you know it is the temporary visa status that 
increases that exploitation. But I recently sat on an inquiry where we heard from Pacific um, workers, you know, on wage theft. And it was horrific. It was horrific. They're still living in slave-like conditions with employees. And I think that's... And, and you know, they, they were telling us they were very brave workers who came and, you know, gave evidence um, to us at the inquiry. And they come from their home countries because of poverty, right? Um, and so expecting that they can make money and send it back to their families to improve their situation. And that's not happening. They don't even have money to live in the squalid conditions that they're forced to live in. Um, so I think where, again, if you look at it from the international aid perspective, um, it is, you know, when improving those communities in their own countries as well, you know, sure, if they want to migrate, they can, but they, they are desperate. To, to come here and make money. So that in itself tells you what a big poverty problem um, those Pacific countries have. And that's something that, that is, you know, at the root cause of this issue as well. So that's something that needs to be addressed too. But I think the exploitation is a major, major issue. And unless we address that, and I think it partly will be addressed with permanent visa, um, you know, permanent uh, residency provision. So it's a, it's, it's a move, it's a good move. Ryan, do you have a follow-up question there? Um, yeah, so, oh, this is, is it on? So, yeah, on that, would you see the expansion of more well-regulated so, sort of worker-centred pathways and, for example, the expansion of these permanent streams as one way to place work agency at the central and essentially decolonise development, like you were saying before? Would that be one effective way to do that? Look, I think, you know, as Mayreen was just saying, I think you've got to be looking at it in the context of it's not the answer of, you know, alleviating poverty in the country um, to just say, well, you can all come and work in Australia. And, and I think we need to be tackling that and really supporting those communities. Because for a lot of those people, even if they think, yes, it's a good opportunity, I think there are probably just as many who would say they would prefer not to come and work in Australia and be away from their families. They would, they would prefer to be able to be, you know, living a reasonable life and getting what they need for themselves and their family in their home country. And it's a bit about a de desperation because that's not available to them. Um, the resources aren't there. There are the impacting, you know, increasing impacts of, of climate change, for example, that there's this sense that, well, okay, we'll give it a go and we'll see if we can, um, you know, do some good in Australia. So I think it's, it's not... I, I think it is seen as being a bit of an easy answer to you know, be solving our worker shortage of you know, bringing people in who basically don't have a lot of power here. Um, even if you set up you know, what seem to be well-regulated schemes, you have got workers that have very little power and are very, very open to being exploited. We are, we're going to have to finish up in a moment, but there is one pressing question I, I want to ask you before we, we do. You mentioned, of course, the Solomons and also mentioned, of course, our um, Defence Minister uh, uh, reminding us that we need to prepare for war. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to, to hear from you, what role, if any, do, you, do the Greens see um, national interest playing in the aid program? Well, I don't see national interest playing a role in the aid program, to be really frank. And this is the whole concept of decolonizing aid, mm -hmm. that it is not for national interest. It is for the interest of those communities. Um, that's how we do it. And it, it is, you know, the national interest side of it will come in through, you know, working in, once we genuinely partner with those communities. I mean, there are clear benefits that will flow on from it. But aid should never be about national interest. I'm very clear on that. And that we are never going to have sort of what's in our national interests and, and national security here unless we have, you know, the, the concept of common security I really like, mm -hmm. and which is in the, the Common Security 2022 report, if people haven't read it, I really recommend it, which is in looking at, well, how do, you, how do you build peace and security? And you've got to be looking at the peace and security of everybody across the globe. So it's in our national interests to have well-functioning communities that aren't living in poverty in our region, which is you know, not so much from an aid perspective, but from a foreign policy perspective. Mm -hmm. That's why I find it absolutely unfathomable as to why we haven't imposed sanctions against the leaders of the coup in Myanmar, because it's not in our interests to have a you know, corrupt 
anti-democratic regime in, in Myanmar. It's in our national interest to have a thriving, sort of, you know, well, um, well-managed um, democratic country there. If, if the national interest is not at all part of your cons- or, uh, Greens' consideration in terms of, of the uh, aid spend and allocation, how do you sell that to the Australian public? I think the Australian public, the Australian public aren't stupid. Like I said, when I announced my decolonisation policy and kind of reimagining aid, not as something that is in the national interest, but as something that is for global justice, people understand it pretty much. I mean, people are aware of the injustices done over centuries to the global south. You know, we know the you know the arbitrary <laughs> boundaries drawn around countries have divided us into you know the haves and the have-nots. Mm. Um, and people understand that. You just need to have a conversation, Virginia, and you know, people understand that. I mean, and again, it's like, it's that concept of this is not national interest, nor charity. Um, this is about repairing the damage that has been done. Uh, being devil's advocate here, mm. now, this is the last question I'll yeah. ask, but um, with, with a limited pot of money mm. to spend, for mm. example, mm. O- on aid, if you're not including considerations around national interests, how do you determine where you spray that money? Who, who decides on what basis if we're not also considering Australia's mm. national interests? Well, we um, spend money in many areas without always having the national interest at the heart of it. Um, I mean, we can, the criteria can be, can be many. It could be maybe, you know, our region, our neighbours looking at that and, you know, or who are most impacted by the climate crisis at the moment, for instance. I mean, there could be a number of criteria other than us uh, thinking about what we can get out of it. I mean, I mean overall, I mean, it, it's need, isn't it? And it's, and, it's, and it's doing those reparations and making up for the, um, the absolute yeah, attacks that have been made over centuries mm-hmm. on people's well-being. And, and it's so like, as yeah. A, as a, as a, there'll be a combination of that, that history and where those reparations are needed mm. and existing need. And obviously need would be a big thing as to working out, you know, exactly on that basis of need and what Australia's role is in meeting that need and looking, and looking at us, you know, working multilaterally as well. You're looking at other yeah. countries that deliver yeah. aid, much more aid than we do and coming up with kind of a global plan mm. that shouldn't be that hard so we can actually, we have the money across the world in the global north to be able to alleviate poverty um, across the global south. And we need to look at it as a partnership with those countries and delivered uh, with the communities on ground. It shouldn't be that hard. It's just not a priority. OK, unfortunately, we are. We've got a, we can take a couple of questions. Thank you, Beth. I have a question just here. Hi, I'm Murray. I, I just, um, I think the point seven objective, uh, percent objective is very noble. But in, just in a practical sense, and we've teetered onto it a bit here, where do you spend it and how? I mean, there's really no indication of what sectors you think are important, and I appreciate uh, decolonisation, and you've separately talked about funding climate. But this is increasing aid by over a billion dollars a year, every year, until 2030. So uh, I'd like to know, you know, do you have a feel on geography or sector, or, as you mentioned, multilaterals, how would you use this extraordinary amount of money increasing every year for, for the best outcomes. It's not an extraordinary <laughs> amount of money, I'm sorry. Um, you know, it, it's uh, just something that is a bare minimum. I mean, we would work obviously with NGOs and the sector to determine that. For me, at the heart of this is gender equity. I think that is really crucial. So, you know, what I would like to see, much more programs um, to alleviate that. Um, you know, climate crisis is another one. Um, obviously, education is, is critical, um, um, you know, in, uh, in the global south. And again, um, women and girls come into the picture as well. I don't know, Janet, if you yeah. have any others. Look, I think if you put the call out mm. to country, developing countries around the world and saying, what would you like Australia to spend money on? You had a process of actually saying, this is what we really think is, is needed and will bring value to our country. You would easily, you would get um, proposals that would use up that money. Obviously, we need to have then the capacity to manage that money wisely. Um, and that was boosting mm-hmm. that capacity mm-hmm. and that um, ability to manage it. But I don't think there's going to be any problems at all with, that, with spending that amount of money, and it's an appropriate amount of money 
for Australia to be spending. I mean, Australia has stopped giving aid to many countries over, the yeah. many, over many years, so we could start those programs again for one. We've got another question just here. Hi there, Bridie Rice from the Development Intelligence Lab. We have heard you both speak so powerfully today about justice, principles of foreign policy, decolonisation as well, and frankly, I think many of us would have our hearts warmed by that kind of refreshing discussion around development. But we're going to step outside here, back into an election cycle where the geopolitical headwinds are blowing strong. And the domestic narrative here in Canberra beyond this development community is more about seeing aid as a strategic asset. And in fact, far from redistributing power, it would be seen as shoring up power um, against rising authoritarianism. So how are the Greens going to navigate this push uh, between the reality of, of what Australia faces in our region and the principles that you're proposing our aid program stand for? Mm. I mean, to me, it's looking at, well, we, if we want to, you know, we want peace, we want security in our region, we know that there are these rising authoritarian powers. So we've got this analysis that, yet yeah, the world's facing some big problems, how do we deal with them? And then you've got a choice of what you, you know, where you put your resources. And I think if you look at it, you know, clear-eyed, you'd say you're still, even in this, of the rising threats, you are still much better off spending your money in, in terms of development and building civil societies and building democracies and lifting people out of poverty than spending money on another nuclear-powered submarine. You know, you get a lot more bang for your buck by doing that um, in terms of dealing with the, the issues that the world faces at the moment. Okay, we'll just take another question up here. Hello. Oh. It is on. Uh, Stephen Jedgetts here from ABC. Uh, Senator Rice, your colleague, uh, Jordan Steele-John, uh, remarked recently that uh, criticism of the China-Solomon Islands uh, security pact was uh, paternalistic and potentially racist. Uh, can I ask, do you share that view? And given some of your fierce criticisms, uh, in particular of the Chinese government crackdown in Hong Kong, are you worried about the prospect of Chinese police potentially coming to Solomon Islands underneath that uh, pact? Mm. Thank you. I mean, it, I think at its heart you've got to so acknowledge that Solomon Islands is a sovereign country and they are making decisions that they... And you'd want the Solomon Islands to be making decisions in the way that um, is for the benefit of the Solomon Islands and the Pacific. And so... In terms of my, concern, my concerns about the, their arrangements with China is, to, is the fact that China is an authoritarian power. Mm. And personally, yes, I would be worried about Chinese police sort of coming in to be, you know, actually not supporting democratic rights in the Solomons. And that potential, I think, would be potentially, you know, quite disturbing. Um, but I think in terms of the Solomons, we've got to acknowledge that if this is a decision that the Solomons have made transparently and accountability and in good democratic processes, well, then that's a decision that they have made. Um, and it does need to be also be considered in the context of, of you know, US power in the Pacific over a long time and that are we just, in terms of criticising that, that deal, seeing it in as you know, a very pro-supporting US power and ongoing, you know, um, support of, the, of US power in the Pacific. It's, it's not a straightforward thing for us to be saying um, that, you know, it's, it's a bad thing. But it is something that I think that, yeah, we've got reason to be concerned about because of China's nature as an authoritarian power. Thanks, Stephen. Well, I think it's appropriate to, to finish the last question on the media. <laughs> <laughs> we'll throw it back to you, Beth. Thank you. Thanks. Please join me in thanking Senator Rice, Senator Faruqi and Virginia Hausiger. Thank you all for joining us here today, whether you're in the room here in person or online. I just wanted to mention our two future forums in partnership with ACPID and IDCC. We'll be hosting two more forums over the next 10 days. On Monday, 9th of May at 10 a.m., Labor's Shadow Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Pat Conroy, will join us to present the opposition's priorities. And on Friday, 13th of May at 10.30 a.m., 
The Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Zed Seselja, will join us to present the Coalition's platform. We hope you have enjoyed today's event and please join us for the rest of the series. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.